This is really a, a really tremendous honor to be here. Uh, I have a lot that I'd like to talk about this morning, a lot looking forward and a lot looking backward, as Chris uh, suggested. Uh, when Avi called me in the summer saying, what do you want to talk about in five months? Uh, I wasn't sure at the time, except it was the end of June and it was already the hottest summer on record in the United States and the wheat and the corn crops were dying and long before this massive storm hit uh, the, uh, the eastern seaboard last week or the week before, it was clear that certainly climate change would be on everyone's mind, like, I guess except for those of the uh, presidential candidates. Uh, and I was also thinking a lot about the AI winter, at least the most recent AI winter, which for me was 25 years ago when students were asking me about it and I suddenly felt like, tell us about the war, daddy. Uh, <laughs> that there was a new generation of graduate students who had not really lived through some of the events that I had when I was primarily doing AI and that I think actually bear significantly on the work that we do in the semantic web. So what I want to do this morning is do a little bit of retrospective discussion of where the field has come from, particularly in its semantic technology uh, history. Talk a little bit about, I think, those conferences that Nigel alluded to last night during his after dinner speech, which I think cemented a lot of our thought about intelligent systems that actually bears a lot on the semantic web. And then talk about some of the predictions that people have made about the semantic web and how we can learn not only from those predictions but also from uh, some of the previous work that's been done in intelligent systems. So first, uh, by, by way of full disclosure, uh, you should know from my background, I'm primarily approaching this work from an engineering perspective. I don't pretend to be a philosopher or a logician. I view the semantic web as a great opportunity to provide new functionality for e-science in general, for, for biomedicine in particular, which is, as Clu said, is my prim primary area of work. And I think like a lot of people in this room, I was heavily involved in standalone AI systems and for me, the semantic web offered all kinds of opportunities. Uh, 12 years ago was an opportunity to go to Sardinia, which was kind of interesting. And I think some, some, in some sense now that we are entering the second decade of ISWC conferences, it's really a good time for uh, ret retrospective analysis. And at the same time, there's a lot of numerology about 2012 that's been brought to my attention lately. It's been 26 years since the very first Banff Knowledge Acquisition Workshop. Uh, Nigel showed you some photos of some old Banff workshops. Uh, given the uh, state of some of the people in those photos, few of us remember actually what was going on. Uh, but uh, I think those workshops were a very important foundation for work in artificial intelligence as it related to expert systems. 25 years ago was the first European knowledge acquisition workshop. 25 years ago also was the onset of the AI winter, which I alluded to earlier. And I think, first of all, I should say before I do anything else, I should make a plug for the special issue of the International Journal of Human Computer Studies that Enrico Mota uh, edits. Enrico is putting together a special issue, which I believe should be in newsstands soon, uh, which will be a retrospective analysis of uh, the Banff workshops and the legacy of, the, of, of those activities. I will say with great pride, at least this is what Stanford, Stanford believes, that 20 years ago the first web server in North America was installed at Stanford at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Laboratory. And it's been 12 years since that dogstool seminar that Nigel alluded to as well, which I think brought many of the AI people together to think about what the semantic uh, web would be like. And also just incidentally, I keep on being reminded that 2012 was the end of the Mayan calendar, so again I'm really delighted that Avi asked me to give this talk this year. So the semantic web really, for those of us who were doing AI research at the time, was this incredible opportunity. It was a different kind of AI quantitatively. We just thought about the size of the web and the way the web was growing, uh, the idea of having distributed knowledge anywhere in the world, and this enormous problem-solving space that the web offered. And qualitatively, it was quite different from what we were used to as well. The web was a place where anybody can say anything about anything. It's a place where anyone can access any resource at any time. And we th really earnestly believed that the methods that we were applying to intelligent systems at that time 25 years ago, well, 20, 12 years ago, uh, would have obvious ramifications as we began to transition to this new kind of knowledge medium. 
And then many of us were captivated, I hate to say, by the Scientific American article, which in many ways defined our field, and which we still cite probably more than any other semantic web publication since. But at the same time, the kind of vision that Tim and Jim and Aura laid out was really quite remarkable. It was a vision of personalized agents that could book flights, that could shop for clothes, that could manage our smart houses, that could floss our teeth. And those agents have not quite arrived yet, at least the teeth flossing agents. And I think one of the things that is, is, is worth thinking about is the way we thought about where we were going tw uh, 12 years ago and where we are now. And what immediately comes to mind is something which I thought was a joke until I realized that the Gartner Consulting Group actually views this as the basis of actually the ba of earning quite a lot of money in its uh, IT consultation practice, which is their research hype cycle, which I imagine many of you have seen before. But this provides the basis by which Gartner summarizes for its clients where they think new technologies are going. And you can see that there is the upslope of the uh, technology trigger and the peak of inflated expectations the trough of disillusionment, the slope of enlightenment, and the plateau of productivity. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where we are as far as the semantic web is concerned, and I'll get back to that uh, toward the end of uh, the talk. But what I want to say first is that as I thought about the Scientific American article and as I thought about Gartner's analysis of IT, I couldn't help but think about where we had gone in AI. So back in the early 80s, there was more hype than you could ever imagine. Uh, Business Week, Forbes, all the lay press were sort of talking about how the expert systems technology that was coming out of industrial laboratories uh, that had originally derived from academic laboratories was soon going to become such a common commodity that it would change the way we live uh, in the world. That every process that involved any kind of knowledge would be automated, be accelerated, would be uh, obviously aided by the kinds of technologies that uh, the, the artificial intelligence community was, was, was promoting at the time. And to give you a sense of what that hype was like, uh, my f most salient memory as a graduate student was going to Ichikai 85 in Los Angeles, which was billed as the largest event in Los Angeles since the LA Olympics of 1984, uh, which was an event that I had some scientific content, but people really don't remember the science that was discussed there. Mainly they remember the trade show. Uh, this is not the trade show for Ichikai 85. This is the trade show for the Consumer Electronics Show, but it's about the same order of magnitude. And I remember being bused to uh, uh, Beverly Hills, uh, where IntelliCorp had an outpost on Rodeo Drive, serving these graduate students with no money to spend at all, all kinds of uh, ice cream treats and everything to just and bring, bring up the, uh, the idea of artificial intelligence and expert systems and how it was going to change the world and try it obviously to, to, to change the, uh, the opinions of people who might be making decisions at the time. Doug Lennock claims he gave a tutorial and earned enough to, uh, honor, honorarium to buy a new sports car. I don't deny that. And I asked Ed Feigenbaum to tell me a little bit about AAAI's initial uh, earnings because of these conferences and he showed me this, this graph which shows AAAI uh, founding uh, itself from about 1980 and uh, basically earning over a million dollars in just five years on the basis of money coming in from his conferences. And it was just, this was just an unbelievably heady time, both to be in graduate school and also to be in the intelligence systems industry, which was sort of taking over Silicon Valley at the time. And then we all know what happened next. Um, I actually don't have the numbers uh, for AAAI after all of this. I don't know exactly how fast the decline was, but a multi-million dollar industry building list machines and software for building expert systems just died. And this was the AI winter of which we now speak. Now obviously those in industry thought the AI winter was a time of enormous gloom, but I think for those of us in academia it was actually a good thing. It was a good thing because actually none of us wanted to go to academic meetings that looked like the Consumer Electronics Show. And suddenly we had small focused meetings. Uh, basically the failure of the expert systems industry basically provided impetus for us to understand why. And it opened up a lot of opportunities for smaller scale conferences and workshops where two things were going on. 
One, the vision of AI had not disappeared, and I think all of us who participated in those workshops really were latched on to the possibility of the, the promise of artificial intelligence. And at the same time, being able to look out and see a floundering expert systems industry gave us a lot of pressure to try to understand in an academic sense why all this was happening. And probably the greatest venue that led to a confluence of people coming to talk about these ideas was Banff, where Brian Gaines and John Booz originally created a workshop that brought together a lot of the people who are in this room to talk about problems of the knowledge-based systems industry and why it was so difficult to build intelligence into machines. And I think a lot of the things that have come out of the Banff workshop influence the work that we do here in the semantic web community. And I think that's really good. I think there are also a lot of lessons that were learned through the Banff workshops and the ECO workshops and the other kinds of uh, settings that uh, focus primarily on standalone intelligent systems that don't make its way into our discourse here. And what I'd like to do this morning is to talk a little bit about some of the things that we, I think, learned from the, the standalone AI experience that may bear on the way we think about the semantic web. And I'll use this opportunity to sort of summarize what I think were some of the salient things that we learned during that era. And I think this, these are important things to talk about because I think they bear directly on the semantic web. And they're also things that we tend not to talk about very much in our community. And I think it'll be very helpful if you will, to let me tell you what did happen in the War Daddy and review some of the things that were salient during the 1990s that I think clearly bear in our practice in the current millennium. So if I will, I think some of the things we learned was that rules don't scale when building intelligent systems, and I know that is gonna feel controversial to some of you. Uh, that cognitive tractability matters, that probably sounds like a platitude, but it's a real thing. Meaning is situated, and I'm about to open up a can of worms there. Uh, modeling problem solving we know is very hard, and I think something that we all can agree on, which I think really emerged from the work that was done in the KA workshops, is that reusable patterns are really a good thing, and I think what really unites the science that we do is trying to understand the abstractions that are important for the semantic web, for artificial intelligence, basically for managing complexity in ways which I think bear out significantly in the kind of work that goes on in this community. Now let me back up a little bit for those of you who are under age 25. Um, an expert system as it was construed uh, at, that, at the time of the original AI winter, if you will, was viewed as having two parts. It had a knowledge base, which was typically a rule base, a whole bunch of rules that were meant to chain together, and an inference engine, which most of the time was a rule interpreter, which was able to interpret those rules, chain them together, and generate, if you will, intelligent behavior or some kind of advice. So generally, when people were building these expert systems, they were viewed as consultation systems where you would come to the system with a problem, you would describe the problem for the system, the rules would be interpreted by the inference engine, and out would come some recommendation. And I'm realizing I don't have a pointer up here, so I will just gesticulate madly throughout this talk. Uh, probably the most exciting advent in the expert systems world occurred around 1980 when John McDermott created a system called R1. Uh, R1 was called such because John said that last year I didn't know what a knowledge based system, what, what a knowledge engineer was and now I R1. Um, and R1 was initially installed at Digital Equipment Corporation which basically paid for it. So, some of you may remember a company called Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, which also had the uh, goal of trying to be able to come up with what was then state-of-the-art computer systems, which at like the, all the computer systems at the time, thanks Ben, uh, had to be constructed by hand. The idea of a computer that doesn't come out of a box is also kind of uh, frustrating or difficult to think about for some of us. But every, any time a, a salesman placed an order, there would be a list of parts, and what R1 would do would be to take that those list of parts and figure out how to assemble them on the back plane of the computer, figure out how to minimize the amount of cabling, trying to put things near each other that needed to be near each other, and to make the best kind of arrangement that would then be a one-of-a-kind manufacturer for the, for the end customer. By 1986, two things happened. The system was called XCON because Jack felt funny about the name R1. Uh, and it had really been enormously successful. It had put together about 80,000 orders, uh, but it was beginning to show problems. 
And in one of John McDermott's famous papers, he drew the number of rules in XCON over time, showing good news, as you see, after a few years, they were able to actually greatly reduce the number of rules as they understood abstractions that could allow the rules to be brought together in, in more intelligent ways. But eventually, the number of rules went off the chart as more and more systems were added, and the number of rules never seemed to asymptote, they just continued to increase. And by the time the whole uh, system was, was, was put out to pasture, it was unmaintainable because it was really difficult for the deck engineers to understand how rules related to one another. And they were basically stymied because whenever they added a new rule, they somehow would cause all kinds of un unintended side effects and all of the previous rules had to be reconsidered. And so I think R1 is a good example of an extremely successful commercial application that ultimately died because it became too complicated. I think in the academic circles, uh, we certainly t point to Meissen, Ted Shortliff's uh, thesis from the 1970s that was able to diagnose and make recommendations for treating infectious diseases. And Meissen was enormously complicated. Meissen was a soup of some 400 or 500 rules. And Bill Clancy basically made his career showing all the things that were wrong with Meissen. Uh, because although it was well maintained initially and had great uh, uh, recommendations to offer when it was a relatively small self-contained system, as it grew, it became increasingly unmanageable. And I'd like to think that we've learned from all of that, but then when I see what's going on on the web today, I kind of grimace. Um, and I guess I, in some sense the Protege team feels partially responsible. But I see people creating these enormous rule bases and this is not meant to be read because I don't think anybody can read it when po poking his eyes directly at the monitor. Uh, but we see increasing use of rules on the semantic web in ways which are very reminiscent for the explosion of rules and the kinds of intelligence systems that people were building in the 1970s and 1980s. I think some of, the rule, some, some of the things that we learned about that experience clearly have to transfer over to us because we know how important rules are in, in, the, in the semantic web layer cake. I want to pause and just say, I, I, I put this slide in because I know that I'm required to show it. <laughs> so I want you all to soak it in. There's actually another required slide for all semantic web talks, and I'll get to that slide a, a little bit later in the talk. But fundamentally, I think we have to really think carefully about how we use rules on the semantic web and to try to learn some of the lessons of the past 25 years in that area. talked about rules. I think the other major lesson that came out of the AI experience was really not the importance of computational tractability, which all of us take for granted, but this notion of cognitive tra tractability and the idea of what we do really matters for people. Uh, when Daphne Kohler first came to Stanford, I asked her for an example of one of the most exciting belief networks that she had created, and she sent me this slide. And I think we are certainly in, 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 in the uh, habit of extolling complexity because I think many of us believe that one of our advantages in being able to work with a medium as malleable and as flexible and as extensible as the computer is that it allows us to create very large data structures and to perform really exciting inference on these large data structures. But at the same time, we have to remember that the things that we create are not one-offs. They persist and they need to be maintained over time. And I think everything that we create on the semantic web from, well, from rules, uh, which obviously need to be understood not only in terms of the isolated rules, but the patterns with which rules are invoked, are really critical to being able, being able to build the kinds of enduring systems that are really part of our, of our work. I mean, many of us are working on ways of trying to make rule-based representations more tractable, to figure out how to come up with abstractions that will combine rules or relate rules to one another. And I think some of the visualization work that's being done in this community is fantastic. And I think we need a lot more of it because I think there's going to be a tendency for our systems to grow in size, both in terms of the number of entities and in terms of their relationships. And we need ways by which developers, and users and maintainers can all have a better handle on what's going on. I think we, one of the things that we like to do, for example, is to show the linked data cloud. This, this is the other required slide for my talk, by the way. And 
we look at it in terms of the achievement that we've been able to have by linking various data sets together and the promise that is going to happen by being able to extend these various data sources uh, to one another. But ultimately, our problem is going to be understanding what's out there, being able to take advantage of what's out there. And I think for that, we're going to need uh, better tools that will allow us to visualize and understand those relationships. And I realize this is already an important area of work in this community, but I'm going to emphasize that I, th I think we need a lot more of it. We need this because, unfortunately, we sometimes have a tendency to uh, err on the side of completeness or power rather than on simplicity. And I, I think in my own experience working in the biomedical community, I feel really burned by this in a way because at a time when I was hoping that the biomedical community would come together recognizing the importance of semantic web standards, I can point to the work of the open biomedical ontologies community, which initially decided we don't need of that, any of that fancy computer science. All we need is a directed acyclic graph and they began to build ontologies, some of the most important ontologies in biomedicine, using a rather impoverished representation, which actually in its very earliest forms neither had a semantics nor a syntax. It took several years actually for there to be a BNF. And I think over the years the open biomedical ontologies community has gradually moved in a direction where they recognize the importance of standards, where what is now, what used to be called DAG format is now called OBO format and now looks almost exactly like, like AL. I think progress has been, has been made. But I think it's important to recognize how many of my colleagues were turned off when they were frightened at the complexity of the standards that we were trying to promote. And I think I, no one in this room need, needs me to wax on the issue related to schema.org. I think there's a real issue in terms of being able to promote what we do in ways which convince people that it's going to be tractable and useful. So I've mentioned rules, I've men mentioned cognitive tractability. Let me talk about the situated nat nat nature of knowledge and symbols. I'm not going to try to solve the symbol grounding problem today, but I think it's really important to emphasize how much the knowledge acquisition community has wrestled with these problems and how I think we need to spend redoubled effort on trying to address them. So if you will, again, the traditional knowledge-based system is viewed as this knowledge-based, typically rules or some other pro propositional representation, and some inference engine that operates on those rules. And one thing to emphasize is that typically we may spend a lot of time trying to have a very precise formal semantics for what's in that knowledge base and then ultimately the inference engine sort of operates on those symbols and all of our formality goes away and we're left with an operational semantics such that the rule base or whatever is in that knowledge base means whatever the inference engine says as it performs its procedures. What comes out is intelligent behavior. But the thing to emphasize is that for users to make sense of that intelligent behavior, they have to be able to do more than simply interact with a computer. They have to be able to understand not only the symbols in that knowledge base, but how those symbols get translated into a problem solving activity. Something that we don't really think about explicitly, something which is uh, of concern because most people who develop intelligent systems or semantic web applications, for that matter, are not thinking about that in any direct way. In 1986, Winograd and Flores came, up with, came out with a book which probably was more influential than anything else in changing the attitudes of people in the knowledge acquisition community. And Winograd and, that was not the book, no. Uh, Winograd and Flores uh, made the statement that when we look at how people interact with computers, we should be thinking about how people interact with any kind of a system that generates symbols. And they went back to the idea of hermeneutics, the study of ancient manuscripts, and the idea that one really can't understand ancient manuscripts without really studying the context in which the symbols are represented, the ways in which sentences relate to one another. Basically, the well understood mechanisms by which scholars try to decipher old texts and by that matter the same way you and I try to decipher say the novels and other kinds of informal literature that we read. Every time we are reading text we're not just looking at sentences but trying to understand why the author made that particular word choice. 
why the author chose not to say something, for example. And as we're second guessing why the author said things, we're learning what it is that the author is trying to communicate. And Winograd and Flores were very clear saying that when we, when we communicate in print media, we have some sort of author who has a conceptualization of what he or she wants to communicate, who puts it down in text. And when we read that published text, we're doing more than just looking at the natural language. As intelligent agents, we are trying to reconstruct in our heads what it is that the author had in his head when those symbols were selected. And that the only way to be certain about the semantics of what's in printed text is that there be a, at least a moderate convergence between the way the reader conceptualizes the problem and the way the author conceptualizes the problem. And if that convergence d doesn't work, well, that may be why you don't like Stephen King novels or I don't like some Agatha Christie mysteries, because we may not be able to achieve that kind of harmony and understanding the conceptualization of the author to be able to get the semantics that really are intended. Well, the argument was made and still is made that that principle still applies when we build intelligent systems. That when someone authors an intelligent system, we are building some sort of a knowledge base that's based on our conceptualization of what knowledge needs to be represented and how that knowledge is going to be used. And that the developer of an intelligent system has his or her own copy of the inference engine that operates on that knowledge base. And when we publish in this kind of a medium, we communicate by transferring our knowledge base to a recipient who has his or her own copy of the inference engine, who applies that inference engine to the published propositions in the rule base or knowledge base and derives some information out of it. But the important thing that comes along with this idea is that the semantics of the terms with which the user has to deal are derived from the conceptualization of the author of the knowledge base who created the propositions in that knowledge base in the first place. And this comes to, to bear very easily when we look at some, well, let's look at the Meissen expert system as a classic example. So here's a very small transcript of Meissen. And what happened in Meissen is, this is 1970, a doctor would be at a teletype, a uh, computer would ask a question, the doctor would provide an answer. We see question 30 is case 168 a compromised host? No. How many days, for how many days has case 168 had abnormal neurologic signs? One. For how many days has case 168 had neurological symptoms? Nine. Has case 168 had recurrent evidence of tender or enlarged salivary glands? User says why. In this situation, saying why is like saying WTF. It's like, I have no idea. I have no idea why you're asking me this question. Uh, what did you really mean there? Now, a couple things to, to point out. The why facility in Meissen is really important because in, in order to understand symbols like evidence of tender and large salivary glands, the user may actually have to actually see the rule that concludes that value in order to understand why that question is being asked. So the, in this case, although Meissen touted itself as having enormously powerful explanation facilities, what was really happening here, whenever a user said why, was saying, I don't understand your symbols, show me the knowledge base so I can understand what the semantics so that those symbols actually are. And other questions, which may not get the, the why answer up here, are really issues where, show, show issues where the semantics are really derived from that mutual understanding between the developer and the user. What it means to have abnormal neurologic signs is something that the developer of the system takes for granted the user will be able to understand. What is a compromised host is something that, again, is something that the developer has in mind and the user has in mind and allows the question to get answered. In this case, we know that a compromised host is a really sick patient who may have an abnormal immune system, may be an alcoholic, may have other factors which make them particularly susceptible to disease. I'm guessing some of you in this room looked at the term compromised host and thought that a compromised host was some kind of a server that had been hacked or a compromised host was the organizer of a dinner party who got particularly drunk. I mean, compromised host can mean lots of things. And for the purposes of interacting with this expert system, not only do we have to know the sense of compromised host that was intended by the developer of the system, we have to know how compromised. Uh, would the system be asking me whether the patient was a compromised host if the degree of compromise was minimal, if it was a cough, if it was a 
a drink every now and then? And those kinds of, of, of questions are not explicit in the transcript, but are there because there's a socially shared understanding of what that symbol means, a shared understanding between the developer and the user, which is not explicit in the dialogue or any part of the rule base that you can point to. John McDermott claimed the same thing happened in R1, that as more and more computers were added to the, uh, the R1 knowledge base, the knowledge base grew and the exact meaning of different parts was different because the, a various part in a PDP-11 might be slightly different from a part in a VAX and the rules might refer to that symbol by the same thing. And again, it's an example of where the meaning is, has to be socially construed and when it's not made explicit, people can get into trouble. Bill Clancy liked to uh, get excited about uh, pointing out minor problems in Meissen. Uh, he talked about uh, rules that conclude the value of a parameter called significant. There was first a rule that said if there are two positive cultures that grow from a, sterile, a site that is ordinarily non-sterile, then the culture is significant. If you have a site which ordinarily has some bacteria growing in it, like your gut, or your nose and you have a culture that's one culture that's positive and that's probably a contaminant, doesn't mean much. You get two, maybe that means a lot more. A new rule get added to the knowledge base. If an infection, if there's an infection that requires therapy and it's cystitis and pyuria or, or white cells in the urine is not present, then the culture is significant. Well, this is a statement that's completely different from the original one, where suddenly the term significant takes on a new meaning, meaning the absence of, of white cells in the, in, the, in the case of cystitis. Suddenly, the term has a new meaning. Any time a user previously said that a culture was significant, the answer to that question may be different now that a new rule has been added to the knowledge base, even though the symbol is exactly the same. And Clancy points out very clearly that the meaning of the symbol uh, depends on the rules that conclude values for those symbols and what people understand about the rules, that the symbols themselves don't have a grounded meaning, but the meaning can be determined only by examining the rules in context and understanding how the knowledge that they represent gets communicated and how people interpret the meanings of those rules. So in the case of Meissen, uh, there were a lot of rules that communicated information about the idea of a culture being significant. Significant could mean that a culture was taken from a site uh, that uh, was ordinarily non-sterile and so it ought to be taken seriously. Or a, a, a significant culture was one uh, that ought to be treated and, uh, and whose tri treatment was simple so that even though the it wasn't clear whether there was really an infection there, you would call the culture significant because it was not a big deal to offer therapy and so you would just treat anyway. And then eventually the word significant meant you wanted to treat because the patient was really, really, really sick and so even though you had no clue what was going on, this is better be treated as significant so the patient would have a chance. Here's a whole slew of different interpretations which enter the knowledge base over time the symbol remained absolutely the same, and yet users, in order to, to answer the question, is this culture significant, would have to have some understanding of what the developers of the system meant when that term was used. The good news is, Meissen was an enormously successful system, and although we can spend a lot of time quibbling about what a term like significant really means and wonder whether Meissen really got the answers right if people didn't understand what that term meant. The bottom line is that although the semantics were socially construed and, that the, and although the semantics were approximate, the system did pretty well. And I think one of the lessons that we're going to, I'm going to have this morning is that we should not get hung up over the fact that often our semantics are not uh, terribly precise, but we can actually do very well even with that degree of imprecision. So when we communicate in knowledge media in the old fashioned way, when we have one inference engine, one, in, one rule base or one knowledge base of some other kind, and we're dealing with a standalone system, we can see very clearly that interoperation with the system requires us to be able to decide as users what did the developers really mean when they decided to create something in the knowledge base that would cause the system to ask me this question. And I'm going to answer that question not on the basis of how I might answer that question in a vernacular dialogue 
but on the basis of what I believe was meant by the question and why the developers of the system might be asking me the question so that I can make sure that the knowledge base will, uh, will interpret it properly. And that is something that we eventually took for granted in the knowledge base systems community. And it's not something that we take for granted on the semantic web. And indeed, when I think about communication on the semantic web, I'm, I'm really not sure what to think. Because we're talking about a, a, a world where anybody can say anything about anything, where there'll be multiple authors and multiple conceptualizations, creating multiple resources that can be addressed by multiple agents. And I think we're going, it's really going to be an important experiment for us as we develop the kinds of agents that uh, were foresaw in the uh, original Scientific American ar article, how we're going to be able to make sure that our agents communicate with users in a way which allows them to make the right constructions of what those symbols mean. And I think that's really going to be an, an interesting and important challenge for the, for the web community. And I think more important, it will set up challenges of having us perform even better evaluations of our work. Because I think in many cases, as was the case in Meissen, although the semantics may not be precise, the actual effects on performance may not be all that great. So on the web, we have a situation where anybody can say anything about anything, where users need to understand what agents do, with what resources they do it, what are the socially agreed upon meanings of those terms, and unfortunately, URIs alone are not going to fix the semantics of the, of the symbols with which our agents are going to need to, 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 to operate. Just because a term is referenced by a URI doesn't solve the problem of telling us what was meant by the user who minted that URI in the first place. And I think we still have the recursive problem of just basically having too many turtles all the way down to be certain about what our, what, our, what our terms mean and to be confident that we'll be able to have precise semantics when our agents operate on these kinds of resources. And of course, the open world ass assumption when we leave open the possibility of almost saying anything makes our, makes our situation here much complicated. Now I should pause and say, in my own community, people have been very nervous about this situation. And what's happening in the bio biological community in particular has been an initiative to try to overcome the problems of squishy semantics. And that's been done effectively by what's called the Open Biomedical Ontologies Foundry. So a number of very prominent scientists who are concerned with developing ontologies in bio biomedicine have proposed that there should be a collection of ontologies whose terms can be absolutely guaranteed to have precise meaning. And Barry Smith, who is a philosopher at the University at Buffalo and a, a variety of his colleagues, have proposed that there be an editorial board, if you will, that will assure that biomedical ontologies that are admitted to the Obo Foundry and get this good housekeeping seal of approval have terms that can be guaranteed to be correct. And if you go to obofoundry.org, what you'll see are a handful of terms, of a handful of terminologies that have been admitted to the Obo Foundry where the terms that are at the top of that list presumably are the members of the foundry that have been blessed by the editorial board, and below it are several dozen other wannabes where various ontologies are, are now vying for admission to the Obo Foundry with the hope that they will meet the Obo Foundry criteria. When you go to the Obo Foundry website, actually, you'll see what the Obo Foundry principles are, and most of those are, are extremely reasonable. The Obo Foundry wants all ontologies to have open content so that it can be shared. Uh, they want some sort of shared syntax, and they're willing to accept Obo format or OWL. They want unique namespaces. They want explicit versioning. They want delineated, delineated content, textual definitions of terms in addition to perhaps logical definitions. They want uh, the ontology to abide by a set of predefined relations, good documentation. This is all motherhood and apple pie, basically. What is not on this list, but, with, but is an unstated co condition for admission to the Oboe Foundry, is that the ontologies in the Oboe Foundry have to abide by the philosophy of Aristotelian realism. And on, I know this group has had all kinds of discussions about constructivism and realism as well. The problem is these are scientists who are insisting that all of their ontologies have terms that have unique values, that have semantics that are defined by universals out there in reality. And I believe that this makes sense because in their view, most of science is settled. 
I'm not going to go into the philosophy of science. I'm not really uh, competent to do that. But there is a strong belief among the oboe foundry, and this is, and I, and I bring this up because this, this, this philosophy is extra, extraordinarily pervasive in this part of the science community, that only realistic elements be in ontologies. What that means, for example, is that if you can't see it, it's not there. And it has led to concern about what it means to represent within ontologies things that may occur at the quantum level. What it might mean to have an ontology things that are postulated to exist but have never been actually observed. So there was a, a wonderful paper uh, that Robert Horndorf and uh, Michel Dumontier uh, wrote a couple of years ago arguing that even though at that point in time no one had ever seen any evidence for a Higgs boson, it made sense to put one in an ontology even though it was not real in the Aristotelian sense. And this, this kind of dialogue has, has perpetuated, and in fact, a great, a great paper by Gary Merrill, Merrill a couple years ago uh, really brought this to the fore, saying that we have to be very careful that in science, we don't really know necessarily what is real, and this paper started an enormous debate to which thousands of members of the biomedical community participated, uh, basically arguing whether our ontologies could be real, whether they could have fixed semantics, whether they would be invariant. And the problem, of course, is uh, between, between us, we know very well that uh, not all science is permanent. Um, there is still a, a large, a large uh, um, initiative to try to save Pluto. Uh, even though Pluto, of course, is now not viewed as a planet, but as a trans-Neptunian object. It's hard to tell a child that Pluto is a trans-Neptunian object, however. Uh, all of us as children sort of remember Triceratops as being one of our favorite dinosaurs. And I, was, I, have, to, I have to confess that even as an adult, I was demoralized recently when I was told that there's actually now quite a bit of controversy in the paleontology community that Trice Triceratops may never have actually existed. Uh, Carol Goebel has his ma her mouth aghast. Uh, because it is now postulated that there is this other dinosaur which is not nearly as cute uh, called Taurosaurus. Uh, and the belief is that Tricer Triceratops is actually a juvenile form of, of Taurosaurus where Taurosaurus is the real species and Triceratops is not. I'm not gonna weigh in there, I'm, I'm not a paleontologist, but to, suffice it to say I think all of us understand informally that science is not always settled. And even in this area of e-science where there's this enormous group of people who believe that we can come up with ontologies with absolutely rigid semantics, I think obviously there's, there's certain problems there. So what does it mean for us if there's no settled science? Well, it means that we can encourage ontologies of all kinds and our ontologies necessarily will evolve because science, basically like the everyday world, is, a, is an area where our meaning is often socially constructed and we have to use that to guide the interpretation of our, our terms. And I think it's a feature that the web allows us to represent alternative theories. And those alternative theories can be very important for us. Sometimes it's, it's useful for light to be a wave. Sometimes it's useful for light to be a particle. Sometimes it's useful to be able to interpret human behavior in, in behavioristic terms. Sometimes it's useful to be, interpret human behavior in Freudian terms. So I guess some people will argue the latter. But we can have all kinds of theories and we can represent them on the web and we can reason about them in ways which I think are very enlightening and very helpful provided that the end user understands which theories are being used and can buy into the semantics of those theories. So on the web, I think we really need to encourage uh, the use of standard ontologies whenever we can. I think that, that goes without saying. I think it's also important, and we don't say this enough, that providence is important not only for those of us who develop ontologies and web resources, but providence is also critical for people who will be using web resources because they have to understand from which those resources, where from which those resources come. And they have to be able to understand what assumptions are built into the semantics of the terms to which they have to relate when interoperating with the semantic web. So I think that's really very critical and something that we often overlook. And I think we also have to accept the fact that our systems fail. They fail because often we miscommunicate, and that's okay. I think one of the major achievements that the web brought, I think, to, 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 the, to the world, certainly to the hypertext community, was the idea that failure was acceptable. And I think probably one of the most important achievements of the World Wide Web is Error 404. 
Um, when um, the web was first proposed, lots of people got very nervous about the idea of links that would not lead anywhere. And I have to just confess that a colleague of mine in graduate school, I'll even tell, say his name, Mark Frizzi, who's now a very distinguished uh, faculty member at Vanderbilt, claims that the most important thing or the most salient thing he did in his professional career was to reject Tim Berners-Lee's paper from the Hypertext co uh, Conference. He rejected it because he was really hung up on the idea of referential integrity, so I no mechanism for, for achieving referential integrity on the web and just concluded, well, this will never scale. Um, and I think the important thing is that it's okay for there to be errors. And I will say when it comes to understanding semantics on the web, it's uh, not only the case that a little semantics goes a long way, but it's also, I think, okay that to say that approximate semantics goes a long way. And I think we just have to feel increasingly comfortable with the idea that although we may work really hard to develop formal semantics for our representation systems, it's okay for us to have a, a fair bit of imprecision in the way in which we actually interpret those symbols directly because as we know, sometimes approximate semantics can be a good thing. Okay. So what have we learned in the, from the AI winner? We talked about rules, we talked about cognitive tractability, talked a little bit about uh, situated meaning. We spent a lot of time in the AI community talking about problem solving, something that we actually don't talk a lot about a lot in the web community. I want to give you a little flavor of the things that we wrestled with and let you know how that I think can, can, can play out in the semantic web community, I think in a, in a very positive way. As I said, I mean, when, when people started building expert systems, they uh, were insistent on building lots of rules. They uh, felt that the more rules there were, the better, because that meant the system was actually better at doing whatever its task was. And Meissen, as you see here, was this, in, in, uh, um, this, this very, very, very complex collection of rules uh, which were difficult for not only users to understand, but obviously for developers to understand. The people who developed these kinds of knowledge bases said that the value in the knowledge bases was that you could just add a new rule and everything would be okay. And the idea of dropping a rule into the soup was very attractive until people realized as soon as you did that there could be all kinds of ripple effects that you would never anticipate. And one of the reasons that the knowledge based system approach tanked and we had the AI winter is that people in the industrial sector who tried harder and harder to build rule based systems had more and more trouble as they put more and more rules into their systems and they couldn't understand the relationships, they couldn't understand uh, how to maintain the systems and they were looking for solutions. And their solutions at that time were actually to abandon the AI approach and just write conventional computer code. But this changed a lot when people like Chandra Sakran at Ohio State University started to think about a generic tasks that could represent procedures at very high levels. And in particular, when Bill Clancy published his tome on heuristic class classification. And what heuristic classification was, was a way of looking at what Meissen did, not as 400 rules that interacted together in this soup, but as very well des described, organized ways of problem solving. So in heuristic classification, there were three kinds of things going on. There was an abstraction hierarchy that described the features of the case that was being diagnosed. So you had a patient who might have a white blood cell count of 2.5 thousand. 2.5 thousand is a low number. It means the patient has this condition called leukopenia. Leukopenia means the patient is immunosuppressed. Immunosuppressed means they're a compromised host. You all know what a compromised host is now. And if they're a compromised host, that suggests they might have gram-negative infection. So there was a heuristic that linked compromised host to gram-negative infection, which could be a part of another abstraction hierarchy, where in this case you went down the hierarchy and said, well, maybe the patient has pseudomonas, maybe the patient has E. coli. And so there was this pattern of inference that went from feature abstraction to heuristic match to solution refinement, which was a way of explaining what Meissen was doing, not in a way that any of the Meissen developers had ever explained it, not in a way that any of the Meissen users had understood the system, but in a way which provided a very coherent way to understand what kind of problem solving the system was, was performing. And this is really cool because not only could we understand Meissen a lot better, but Clancy argued that you could understand a whole bunch of other systems a lot better. He talked about a system called Grundy, which was created by Elaine Rich, which uh, 
was, I don't realize I'm getting some alarms here on my, my own computer, that's not good, uh, a, a system called Grundy which would allow you to walk into a library, tell a little bit about yourself to the librarian, and the librarian would tell you what book you should read. Basically, you, you have some sort of self-described be, uh, behavior, you would describe yourself, and now I'm gonna get into trouble, as a cowboy, as a housewife, as, a, as an accountant, whatever, and somehow there would be uh, knowledge in this knowledge base which would determine what kind of a person you were, what kind of books you like to read, do you want to read sci-fi or fantasy, do you want to read romance novels, do you want to read mysteries, and basically then on the basis of whatever books were in the library would say here's a book you should read. Not a very exciting application actually in, uh, in retrospect, but one which could be understood in terms of heuristic classification with feature abstraction, heuristic match, and solution refinement. And what the heuristic classification approach did was suddenly get everybody excited about thinking not about rules, not about frames, not about individual knowledge representation pieces, but about, about patterns of reasoning and how we could use those patterns of reasoning to build systems. And we call those patterns problem solving methods. And these methods basically provided a way of talking abstractly about a kind of reasoning procedure that might be ap applied in multiple situations to many different kinds of problems. And these PSMs or problem solving methods would make explicit what are the ways in which knowledge could be used in problem solving in order to get from one step to the next. How could you define a heuristic that would link uh, compromised host to gram negative infection? How could you, could, could you define a heuristic that would link class of person to class of book? And Basically, these problem solving methods provided reusable building blocks, not only for thinking about problem solving, for, so not only for modeling problems, but also for actually building code that could implement heuristic classification, or could implement a whole bunch of problem solving methods that the community spent most of the 90s trying to understand. Fault diagnosis, constraint satisfaction, planning, design, scheduling, sequence alignment, and so on. Constraint satisfaction, for example, was an important problem solving method that basically was the foundation of R1, which had to solve a whole bunch of constraints in order to get those parts to fit on the computer backplane. Whole companies, like a company called Trilogy that was founded in Austin, Texas, used a problem solving method for constraint satisfaction over and over and over again to basically go out to the world and say, where can I find constraint satisfaction problems that can be addressed with this particular method? They had a great hammer, they went out looking for nails and made a lot of money doing that. And in the AI community, we're working really hard, not only in trying to identify what are these kinds of abstract problem solving procedures with which we could model problem solving in AI systems and with which we could build those systems, but how can we actually piece them together? And one of the important com uh, contributions of the AI community at that time was to recognize that we could do task decomposition. We could start out with a well, I'm going to be a little bit frivolous here. We can start out with a, with a task like do your laundry and figure out is there some method that will solve the do laundry task? And maybe that method might involve subtasks like sort your clothes and wash your clothes. And maybe there was a problem solving method like classification that could do the, the sorting of the clothes task pretty well. And the idea would be that for anything that you wanted to automate, you would clarify what is the task, what are the subtasks that are needed to solve that task, and what methods do you have in your problem solving method library that would allow you to piece together a structure for solving that problem in a way which would give you insight not only into how the problem solving should take place, but also would give you the code to implement the problem solvers that would allow you in a reusable fashion to put these things together pretty straightforwardly. And there were a lot of experiments, a lot of the very exciting experiments to use PSMs as the basis for building intelligent systems in the 90s, and that basically all went away in the subsequent decade. The web came out, uh, Enrico Mota did a very interesting project that involved a number of us where he created something called the Internet Reasoning Service, which had the direct idea of taking problem solving methods and making, those, making them services on the web. But basically what we find on the web is that services are fundamentally a bit different from the kinds of problem solvers that uh, the AI community had in mind during the 1990s. Our, our services now are not domain independent, they're not very finely grained, they're actually pretty coarsely grained, and they're usually embedded in very domain specific tasks. 
So we don't really have experience in composing uh, domain-independent problem-solving methods or, pro or, or services on the web very, very much, and that may be an area of, of, uh, of future work. But frankly, I don't think there's really much need for that. There's not much call for that because really all the tricky modeling is taking place within the, 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 the web services, if you will, not between them. And I think, frankly, in our community at this point, I think there is much value in being able to construe problem solving in terms of well-defined, reusable problem solving components. But I think those problem solvers belong inside web services and, and enabling us to model what, this, what, what the web services do rather than to isolate them as separate problem solvers that we piece together the way that we did in the expert systems community. So I think that's a, that's a fundamental change. I think the task decomposition obviously will continue to be an important area that we work on. I think it's going to be important in particular when we want to build the kinds of agents that were talked about in the Scientific American article because the kinds of complexities that we have there clearly are the kinds of complexities that you want to be able to address in terms of well-defined hierarchies of problem-solving procedures rather than some of the problems that are associated with conventional computer code. I think the problem that we have on our community right now is that despite the vision in the Scientific American paper, I think we're still at the stage we were five years ago when Jim wrote his famous editorial, uh, Where Are All the Intelligent Agents? I think we have some agents out there that have been very exciting and I think this, this community has done a really good job of giving us some really good exemplars of the kinds of activities that can take place on the web. We still don't have the kinds of agents that will brush our teeth or go do our shopping or change the lighting in our home. So maybe in some sense, uh, we're, not, we're certainly not there yet and there's a lot of work to be done. And I would like to think that the kinds of lessons that the AI community has learned during the course of its winter will have continued ap applicability within the semantic web community. I have a final to say that that's maybe something which is obvious and I think probably the most enduring contribution of what the AI community offered during uh, the 1990s is that reusable patterns are a good idea. And obviously that, uh, that's a truism. In the case of building standalone AI systems, we needed patterns in the sense of reusable ontologies that we wanted to apply in new applications. And so we viewed ontologies themselves as giant patterns. We looked at problem solving methods as patterns for addressing reusable procedures. And in, those, in that case, those reusable procedures were patterns that could be applied to a variety of planning and classification and constraint satisfaction tasks and God knows what else. This community has done a really exciting job on the web of beginning to articulate ontology design patterns and it's really exciting to see whole workshops and conferences in this area. We're beginning to see the choreography and orchestration of web services being things that we want to understand better, not in terms of one-offs, but in terms of patterns themselves was going on implicitly in the AI community 10, year, 10, 20 years ago is now front and center in the semantic web community. And I think it's really exciting to see our community taking on these kinds of, of, of activities because I think those abstractions are important. And as I said earlier, I think basically understanding abstraction, being able to apply abstraction is really at the, at the heart of the whole science that we do. So I think in the last AI winter, if you will, we learned a lot of things. We learned that rules don't necessarily scale, particularly if one wants to build complex systems. We learned about co cognitive tractability, the fact that meaning is approximate, and as I said today, I think approximate meaning is actually a good thing. Uh, we talked about pro problem solving and how difficult it might be to model problem solving, and the idea that patterns are reusable. And I think our community is picking up on all this in varying degrees, and I obviously I'm, I'm here to encourage uh, all of us to be able to start thinking about these things in more explicit terms. I want to do that because it really goes back to the original question I had at the beginning of the talk. All of us have done all this hand-wringing about the uh, AI winter and we obviously have colleagues who may have lost a lot of money in industry as a consequence of the AI winter that set in 25 years ago. But as I said, I think the consequence of that AI winter has caused a lot of deep thought on the part of the academic community and the, industri and, and the industrial community for that matter. And all of us, I think, have learned a lot from that and I think our science has improved greatly as the hype has diminished. 
And the obvious question then is where are we in the semantic web community? Well, what does, the, what does Gartner actually say about us? So I, I actually couldn't afford the document. Gartner did a study of the semantic web um, last summer. They, they're, they're, at that time they were charging $3,000, which I decided was out of my price range. But according to Gartner, we are sort of at the top of the uh, technology trigger peak. Uh, and we have actually reached the peak of inflated expectations. Um, actually, when you look at all of their analysis of web technologies, and again, I didn't buy the books. Maybe someone in this room actually had the money to buy their, 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 their report, in which case you may be able to provide more insight. But I think it's very interesting to look how they categorize web technologies. And some of them they viewed as being on the rise, some at the peak, including the semantic web. What I don't understand, semantic web is at the peak and web 3.0 is sliding into the trough. And maybe it's worth spending the $3,000 to find out why that is the case. My, my hunch is that perhaps they're viewing web 3.0 as the kind of intelligent agent approach to the web that was popularized in the Scientific American article, whereas many people view semantic web simply as linked data. I'm not sure how to really interpret that. We can all speculate a lot about that over the coffee break. But it's also, I think, interesting to see where some other web technologies with which we, which that we love uh, ha have fallen into place in the Gartner Group's analysis. And uh, I, 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 I won't even try to speculate, but allow you to have your own, uh, own guesses to how they reach those conclusions. What you can do, and I, it's not really a, a scientific way of studying what is the future of the semantic web, but Google Trends sometimes can be very interesting and, and sometimes a bit sobering. Uh, so if you search for the trends of, of, of searches uh, for semantic web on Google, uh, it doesn't look like it's a, it doesn't, doesn't look like it's going up at least. There may be error bars there, but um, obviously it's interesting that semantic web is not being searched nearly as much as it was uh, seven years ago. Uh, perhaps more sobering for those of us in this room, uh, when you search for Iswick, um, you don't see a growth in the number of searches. And, I, and it's really important to point out that not only is it, does this graph show you the trend in searches for ISWC, meaning International Semantic Web Conference, this also includes the International Symposium on Wearable Computers. Uh, and I actually don't know what attendance that particular ISWIC gets, but though that's lumped in there as well. I think, is, I think the wearable computer company actually, wearable computer uh, conference actually gets less attendance than we do, fortunately. On the other hand, when you look at linked data, the, the future looks pretty bright. Uh, and maybe that's why uh, uh, the Gartner Group thinks at least what, what they call semantic web is peaking. But I think it's really exciting in some sense to see that people recognize the value of linked data and that trend certainly looks more positive than, uh, than the others. Again, I don't pretend to be a business consultant, but I think some of these, these trends are interesting. And I think as we begin to think about how do we want to mold our science moving forward and also how do we want to market our science so that people understand better what we do, I think these kinds of data actually can be kind of illuminating. So I would say, I think it's not clear what the forecast is. I, I don't think it really looks like winter yet. Um, obviously, there's enormous uptake of semantic technology in the industrial center, in the, in the industrial sector. Uh, Tony Shaw, who for years has run the Semtech conferences, tells me that despite the new trends in that conference and despite the fact that there's now a delusion by having the conference appear now on multiple continents, often mul at multiple times, attendance for Semtech continues to go up. Uh, at Semtech in San Francisco last year, uh, they were on the order of 400 uh, participants, uh, and the buzz was great. Certainly the, bu the buzz about RDF, certainly the buzz about schema.org, which is absolutely incredible, and people were providing uh, demos of all kinds of great applications, which I think was a, 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 real, a real shot in the arm for all of us who do worry about it getting a little bit colder out there. I think the AI hype taught us a lot, and the semantic web community has certainly learned from that, and I, I feel very positive about the way in which we're conducting ourselves in a much more responsible way than uh, certainly my mentors may have done in the 1970s. And I think the past 25 years, as I've said during this morning's talk, has really taught us a lot about intelligence, about uh, intelligent systems, and I think what it means to take intelligence and to move it into the great frontier that's represented by the web and all that it offers, both, both, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And I think basically the 
ideas that are coming out of our community are going to continue to influence our practice. I think we have really gained a lot from the mistakes that have been made by our predecessors. And although it may get a little bit chilly, I'm uh, very excited about where we are and look forward to finding out how the forecast will turn out. Thank you.